In 2020, the Pew Research Group set out to conduct a study looking at the percentage of Christ or percentage of Americans who identified as Christian. And so they set out with the study and gathered all their research and compiled it. And what they found was that 64% of Americans self-identified as Christian. And then they took that number and they compared it to a very similar study from 50 years prior. And what they found was 50 years before that, 90% of Americans self-identified as Christian. So over that 50-year period, there was a 26% decrease in people identifying as Christians. And I really, I, I wonder about those numbers. I'm concerned because I, I worry that they're not, they're, they're actually probably too high. There, there's a lot of people just from experience that identify as Christian that I would say don't really qualify. That they, they call themselves Christian as simply they believe in a God or believe that Jesus existed or some version of Christianity where there's a, a heaven and hell, but they don't meet the follower, the, the, the criteria of being a follower of Christ. Or there's also the, the what we call the Christian cults. They're, they're offshoots of Christianity that have taken the Old and often the New Testament and completely warped and twisted them to be something they were never were and, 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 and change who Christ was and change and say that he would be, in fact, a failure, that his work wasn't complete and that there needs to be more on top of him. And so in my experience, my guess would be, and this is not anywhere close to scientific, that those numbers are probably double what they actually are or, or, even, or even smaller than that. And, and this, 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 this research, though, is emblematic of another problem. And I think actually what is causing this decline in America is, is the decline of the church in America that there is massive amounts of research that show that the church in America, particularly since 2015, has been rapidly declining, that we are losing people. We are losing people, both the new people coming in, that the new next generations and non-believers look at us and see us as judgmental or condemning or hypocritical. And we're also losing people from within the church that they are leaving because they're coming to church and saying, this is, not, this is not what I see as scriptural, and I don't want to be a part of it. And so with this decline of the church, we're left with two different, two different things that we can do. The first one, we can look at that and say, hey, you know what? This is society's problem. The church is declining because society is declining, and they need to figure it out. They need to recognize what we are, and they need to come back to church. Society needs to fix itself. And there's, there's absolutely truth in there. Society is struggling. Society is, is going further away from the, even the principles of God. But if that's our answer to this, is to say, hey, society, you need to fix yourself, we're in trouble. Have you ever tried to ask somebody to start fixing themselves who doesn't want to be fixed? It doesn't happen. It's not going to happen. We can't ask a broken society that's fine with itself to fix itself. And so what we have to do is take the other approach. To say if the church is on a decline, what are we doing wrong? And how can we fix it? What do we need to do to course correct? Where are we veering from a biblical model that is supposed to be growing? And so several years ago, that's what Family Church did. They looked at the statistics that the church has declined and said, we need to be proactive. We need to recognize where we need to change in things, both big and small. And so they set out the change, leadership set out to change its mission, vision, values, its strategy. And we arrived at this, this people, this mission statement, people helping people find and follow Jesus. A drastic shift away from the focus solely being on the Sunday service to the focus being on what it is supposed to be, the church on mission. It's people on mission. And so that's kind of why we're, we're laying out this DNA series. We want to let you in on where we see the church having to go. And today we're going to be unpacking our mission statement, people helping people find and follow Jesus. And we're going to spend today and the next two weeks breaking it apart, explaining what it is, why we're doing it, how we're doing it. And today I'm going to be looking at the first part of it, people helping people. 
why we chose that specific wording. And I'm going to be honest with you. I wasn't involved in, in this, the creation of this mission statement. I wasn't at that level of leadership when it was first created. And it was presented to me, though, early on. And I said, what are you talking about people helping people? That's just redundant like, and unnecessary. Of course it's people helping people. Just say helping people find and follow Jesus. Everybody gets the idea. You cut out one word, and I love succinctness. If you can say something in two words instead of five, I'm great with it. But if you miss this first word, it creates huge problems because it returns the church to what we're trying to get away from. The church was supposed to be its people on mission, the entirety of the body of believers on mission. And when we remove it, what it can easily become and what church has often been is family church as an organization helping people find and follow Jesus. The pastor helping people find and follow Jesus. And it's the exact thing that we're trying to move away from. It has to be the people of God being on mission with him. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians 2 verses 3 through 12 and the influence it has had on this part of our mission statement. And I want to be clear, this isn't the only thing that has influenced it, but we see two main things within these verses that really point to the idea of people helping people. And so to set us up, since we're jumping right into the middle of a book, right into one of Paul's letters, just a little bit of backstory. Paul is writing to the Thessalonians. It's a church that he and Silas planted during his missionary journeys, a church that now he is writing to, to encourage, but also kind of point out some flaws and address some issues uh, about himself and about them. And he starts off the second chapter addressing that his time there and Silas's time, and I'm going to keep just saying him, even though it wasn't just him alone. His time there was not in vain. It was successful, which is fairly obvious, right? He's writing to the church. He sent out the plants and, and he has to have a church to write to. So it was a success. But then he's going to go on and he's going to give two things that really, really shape what his vision and what really is God's vision for the church. And he's going to first start out, he's going to be addressing some, some detractors. There are people who look at Paul and they're trying to discredit him. They're trying to, to, to put him down. They're trying to paint him as something he's not. And so the first thing he's going to be addressing is these detractors. And he's going to be doing it by saying, no, my motivation through all of this is pure. I came and planted this church solely because I'm following Jesus. I'm following the gospel and I want to help save the lost. I want to join God in saving the lost. And so what we're going to see is that people helping people is about motivation. That we chose this specifically because we want to have a properly rooted motivation. A motivation that is about Jesus, about glorifying God, about the, the, or about the gospel, about discipleship. And that's what Paul's about. He writes, for our appeal does not spring from error or impunity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. So here's Paul. He's writing to me. He said, anybody who's questioning my motives, you're out of line. I was always here for pure motives. It was never about me and Silas gaining uh, uh, followers. It was never about glorifying ourselves. It was never about getting rich. And what's interesting is he's talking about this. That is the model that they see. He's speaking to this church that he's planting in, Thess that in Thessalonica, what is modern day Greece. And they worship this pantheon of Greek gods. His contemporaries, his pagan contemporaries, that's what they're doing. They're going around, planting churches, gaining followers so that they're famous or rich. And Paul says, no, I'm not here for that. I'm different because I'm following a different God, the true God. And I care that you come to know him. Not that I become famous, not that you glorify me, not that you make me wealthy, but I'm here because of Jesus and so that you come to know him. And people helping people is an attempt 
to realign our motivation. And I, I get that's kind of tricky because it actually happens on the back end in churches. But we have, as the church in America, the big church, we have misaligned our motivation. And so we have this thing, excuse me, we have this thing called the upper and lower room. And it looks at the organization of a church and how it operates. And we've talked about this some before, the upper and lower room. And most people, we're familiar with the lower room because that the lower room is often played out on the Sunday service. It's what church is most well known for. And the lower room is comprised of four things. There may be some other ones, but these are the main four. Place, personality, programs, people. That is the church building. That's the programs. Yes, the Sunday service, but kids ministry, youth ministry, men and women's ministry, on and on and on. And the people, you guys who attend and, and make connections. And they're all rooted in this idea of the Sunday service or some kind of replication in other ministries of the Sunday service. And what the church has been doing since it has been planted, the early church to now 2,000 years later, is we've been drifting further and further towards this lower room until the church has just basically a lot of times become all about it. And our focus has been here. It's been in, we need to plant people in seats during a Sunday service. And we know what it takes to have been doing that for the next, at least the last hundred years. It's these things. We know if we do these things well, people will come. And, it's, and all it does, as we get more people in and sit down, we say, these things are what matter. So let's put our effort towards those. And when we start elevating these things, and that's what happens, we start elevating these things, the Sunday service, the pastor, we start elevating them to an unhealthy level. And our motivation slips. It drifts away from scriptural basis and it drifts to this. Our motivation is to be self-fulfilling. It's to build up a church program. It's to build up a pastor. And we, like Paul said, he wasn't looking for glory. He never wanted to be glory. But what we do is we start to glorify these things. We glorify them when they're not supposed to be. There's only one person who's supposed to get the glory. That's God. Not a program, not a place, not a person, but God. And so our motivation drifts and it's, and it's, and the problem is it doesn't fully drift. We remain rooted in the gospel at some level, but also at some level we elevate these things and glorify them. And it is destroying the church. It is a massive reason while people outside and within are saying, I don't want to be a part of this anymore. I don't want to be a part of glorifying anything but God. And so we recognize we need to move out of the lower room to the upper room, and I'll get there in a second. But what is happening is it's destroyed because what we're doing is elevating these. And it's often a pastor, right? This idea of we're going to bring people into a church, they're going to sit down, they're going to listen to a message, and the pastor's going to change their life. And if that's what's supposed to happen, it's inevitable that we'll raise up a pastor, put him on a pedestal and say, this is what matters. The pastor is what matters. He is the church. And it's unsustainable. It cannot exist. A pastor cannot be glorified. And as soon as it happens, it leads to their inevitable demise. Two things happen. And the most common one that we actually see is that pastors implode. How many mega church pastors, celebrity pastors have we seen end up here? What happens is they're put up there, they're glorified, and they respond to that glorification on purpose or just incidentally, and they say, I have to meet that expectation. I have to be that perfect person. I have to do everything, and I know I can't. And in meeting that, they have to appear perfect. And there's no perfect pastor. They're not even close. And so they have sin in their life and they hide it or they cover it up. And what do they do to deal with it? They turn to further sin. And darkness always comes to the light. And they implode in just this dramatic fashion. The sin comes out. The church, because now they're not following God necessarily fully, they're following a pastor, they fall apart. Because if, if what they're following falls apart, they inevitably fall apart. We've seen it with massive churches, churches that made huge impact. I remember there's a church uh, that for a lot of us had impact, that church that is semi-local, Mars Hill. They had major 
impact spiritual growth around where I grew up in the Puyallup area, Tacoma, Seattle. And the pastor, Mark Driscoll, and I, from what I've heard, he sets out, I think he's on the right course. He's, he's fully biblically rooted. But as people start to look at him and not God, they say, man, that's what I want. I want that massive, amazing teacher. And he's a fantastic speaker, maybe one of the most talented ever. But when he becomes the church, he falls apart. And he starts dipping into sin and the church starts excusing character flaws and it falls apart. And it's not just him. We see it all over, not just the U.S., but over the world. These churches cannot sustain themselves. And if they don't implode, the other side is they burn out. A pastor glorified or a staff member glorified when they're not supposed to be, they realize I can't keep this up. I can't be everything to all people. I can't be perfect. And they burn out and they just say, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. And it's why the church chews up and spits out pastors. I don't remember the exact statistic, but the average pastor makes something like four years because they can't do it all. They never were intended to do it all. And the church is suffering whenever we elevate this lower room to something it's not supposed to be. And so what we're doing is trying to correct course to return us to this upper room where the church is supposed to be rooted. And the upper room is made up of what is a vision frame. And the vision frame, I'm just going to, before I dive into it, the vision frame is always supposed to be rooted from the Bible, from God's plan, from God's motivation, his vision for the church. And so what it is, is this attempt to contextualize scripture and God's vision for the church, it's right, in our time and place. And we created a mission, vision, values that come from what we see in scripture of God's view for the church. And I'm not going to go through all of it, but that's where we get this people helping people find and follow Jesus. That we're supposed to be not a gathering on Sunday that solves all the problems, but a church mobilized. A church that, yes, gathers on Sunday for a purpose. Instruction and encouragement and some beginnings of community and vision casting. That's not all the church is supposed to be. The church is supposed to be the day to day, not an hour on a Sunday. So it has to change. And, it, and it's this vision of gospel saturation that leads to a multiplication movement. That is the people of Christ, the body of Christ, believing in the gospel, living out the gospel, and then going forth and being disciple makers in all aspects of their life. That was God's vision for the church. Not a gathering, not a pastor doing everything, but his people doing everything. And so we've, we've created this, these values, transformation, relationship, innovation, multiplication. And I'm not going to break down every one of them. I don't have the time to do it today. But relationship, that can't happen on a Sunday service. A, a Sunday service is a monologue. I speak to you guys gathered that's not true relationship. Multiplication. I can't be a disciple maker from the platform. It's impossible. Discipleship re requires a one-on-one -on -one relationship. It, it requires living together, correcting throughout our lives. We're returning to what God's vision and motivation for the church is. And so that's what we've been laying out. That's people helping people. And here's part of what God's vision was. It wasn't one person. When he created the church, it wasn't one person leading a service. It was the body of Christ caring for one another and, and, and finding and pointing the lost back to Christ. He gifted us with so many different gifts. He gave, yes, the apostles, the the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, and their responsibility was to equip the saints for the work of God, for the work of the church. He gave a multitude of gifts, faith and healing and the fun ones, the tongues and the prophecy. And there's just an unending number of gifts, compassion and service. And it was for that to be the church. That was his vision of the church. Not one or a small handful of people living out all the gifts. And in scripture, he talks about this idea of a body, a body, right? It's a perfect analogy, a great analogy. Christ is the head and we all comprise the body. Each and every one of us. 
and we are interdependent. A body depends on itself. What's the most important part of the body? Maybe the brain, but that, in the analogy, that's Jesus. Is it the heart? The heart's important, but it's relying upon the lungs. It's relying upon the blood vessels. It's relying upon everything to keep it going. Each part of the body is reliant upon the other. And that was God's vision for the church. You and me, differently gifted, reliant upon each other so that we can be growing with one another, but so that we could move forward, be the arms and the legs of Christ today. And that's what we're moving towards. That's the idea of people helping people. It takes each and every one of us. And here's the problem. When we're in the lower room and we elevate the lower room, we say all that matters is the people who can do these things. And so often, what, again, that means the pastor or a couple staff members. You're to do the job. You're to be the church. And, and, and in keeping with the body analogy, maybe the pastor's the mouth, but I'm sure you know the mouth doesn't do everything the body does and it can't do everything that the church is supposed to. And so we have to leave the lower room and return to the upper room. And I just wanna, before I move on, the, the lower room isn't bad, except, right, it, it, it's all good things, but it's bad when it becomes the thing because the lower room is stoppable. The lower room, place, personality, programs, people, those will always be changing. But the upper room is unstoppable. That's what Jesus was talking about and Jason and, and Ed were unpacking last week. That's the church that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. It's unstoppable. And so I want to take some time now to look at the rest of what Paul wrote about because he, he's now putting us in the proper motivation and the proper vision. And now he's going to give some ways in which that actually plays out in a practical way. So Paul, as he continues to write, he's going to look at now how he, how he came and actually planted the church, what he did with the people in Thessalonica. And so how that works for us is people helping people is a lifestyle. And we see it reflected in what Paul's going to write about. He goes forward, he says, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. So here's Paul, and he's talking about while he was there, yes, he shared the gospel, but he did it in the confines of sharing his own life. That's what he and Silas were doing. They didn't go in there and just start shouting about Jesus to people. They didn't say, hey, come here and listen to me, and you should have your life changed simply because I presented the idea of Christ and salvation to you. You know, he said, we lived amongst you. We cared about you. We shared a life with you. And in doing that, in doing that, we were able to share the gospel. And in, in this passage, he gives two examples of a mother and father, how he, how he lives like those to them. He, he says, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. This is an example about how he lived amongst them and why he was able to share the gospel. So picture a nursing mother. What is she doing? She's providing sustenance for her baby, literally giving her life through sustenance. And Paul is saying what we were doing there is we were feeding you spiritual truth. We were giving it to you. You didn't have it on your own, but we were providing it to you helping you to grow, right? When we were reborn, it's this image of a baby Christian and they are, they are growing them up. But not only that, I picture some more of what a mother does with her child. We have a, a one and a half year old in our house that we've been providing for. And it's not just about giving them food, it's about caring for them. 
Any of you, if you have a baby, uh, can fully embrace this idea. Your child's crying, middle of the night, middle of the day. And what do you do? You just go up and pick it up. And you rock it, or you bounce it, or you talk to it. You're there when it's having a hard time. And sometimes you're rocking or crying or bouncing. It fixes the problem. But you know what happens more often? You rock and you bounce that baby, and nothing changes. The baby keeps crying. Our, our, our oldest daughter, man, for the first six months of her life, she would just cry and cry and cry. And I would rock and bounce and bounce. And it wasn't about fixing the problem. It was about being there with her through the problem. And that's a great analogy of often what we are doing is people helping people. We are walking alongside them through the difficulties of life, sometimes just helping them get through that, but often just being present with them, letting them know that we love and care for them. That's what Paul was doing, and that's what he is modeling for the church today. That is what we are to be doing. That's how we are to be people helping people. And he talks also about this idea of a father. For you know how, this is later in the passage, for you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God. That Paul's there, Silas is there, they're being, having life on life with them. They're seeing their, their successes as they grow in Christ. They're seeing their failures and their sins and they're encouraging them and they're challenging them through all of it. And you cannot do these things from a platform. I can encourage you, yes, and I can challenge you in a broad sense, but I have to know you. I have to have relationship with you to be able to fully do these. I can't know what you're going through when I'm delivering a message, but if I'm experiencing life with you, then I can do these things. And these things are absolutely necessary for a child to grow up and they're necessary for all of us to grow up in our maturity in Christ. That's what we need and that's why the church has to exist. The entirety of the church has to fully embrace this. And something that's not there but is, is obvious and Pastor Jason and, and, and Ed talked about last week is this doesn't just stop. You don't help disciple somebody and this is an example of discipling. You don't disciple them somebody and then raise them up till they're uh, spiritually eight then and then send them off onto their own by themselves forever. It's a continual silical process that you're pouring into somebody and they start pouring into somebody else, and, but they still need you. You still need other people. We are to be both discipling the, the lost, but also <laughs> the, the people on mission. Picture that mother again, feeding her baby. What happens to a mother trying to give sustenance to a baby who gets none for herself? The mom starves and the baby starves. This isn't to be something scary where, hey, now you're out on your own, go figure it out in your community. No, this is us supporting one another at the beginning and through the entire process. That is people helping people. And so what we're going to be doing as we go forward in this sermon series is taking a look at how do we live this out more fully? How do we both help people find Jesus and help people follow Jesus? And so I'm going to release to the campuses and they're going to spend some time looking at how are we uh, in a, growing in our proper motivation? How are we moving forward and being the church? I love you guys. Thank you. Have a great day.